Christmas is the most magical time of the year. As the days get shorter, the twinkle of lights and decorations fill the night with a beautiful glow, a festive joy. For the royal family, Christmas is a time of tradition and reunion. The extended family comes together to share in their deep Christian faith and celebrate the birth of their Lord. But as with any family, the coming together on Christmas Day can sometimes bring disagreements to light. This was especially true for Princess Diana. Christmas brings its own painful stresses to so many people. Princess Diana endured a less than merry Christmas in 1991. From mistletoe to misery, this is Diana's Christmas with the Windsors. In 1991, Charles and Diana's relationship was really bad. They were basically hardly speaking, but they had the children as a sort of mediating force. Um, so they had to speak, but they had, they'd, they'd been away. They'd been away uh, that summer. They went on, there's a Greek millionaire called John Lastis, and he used to lend his enormous yacht to Charles and Charles took friends, and obviously Diana and their protection staff, and, and, and of course the boys, and some friends for the boys as well. So it was a very big party. And um, Charles and Diana weren't speaking, so that, so that, I mean, Diana would make excuses and she wouldn't necessarily join them for meals. The boys basically didn't really notice because they were so entranced by all the uh, technology on board the yacht, sort of super computer rooms. And at home, they weren't allowed computers. Uh, so they spent their most of their time either diving into the sea or in the computer room. Diana spent a lot of her time on the telephone. Uh, she was miserable. And Charles was uh, chatted to his friends. I think uh, Pe Penny Romsey was there, who, who's now Countess Mountbatten of Burma, and her husband and their children. So there was always people, you know, other people around. By December 1991, Diana and Charles had hardly been communicating over the previous months. Their marriage was falling apart, and Diana had begun secretly cooperating with the Andrew Morton book that would be released the following year, blowing the lid off her husband's decades-long affair with Camilla Parker Bowles, and revealing to the world her own unhappiness and infidelities. Well, I think after they got married, and they went on their honeymoon. I, I think even then, things were starting to unravel a bit because I don't think it, it, it matched what Diana had expected. She had this vision of uh, being like a fairy princess. It must have been an extraordinarily stressful time, keeping secret that the book would be unleashed on the world in 1992 signaling the end of her marriage. Traditions of royal Christmas were sort of set in place by Queen Alexandra, who was Danish. Christmas is always celebrated um, on Christmas Eve. And so they started to celebrate Christmas starting on Christmas Eve. So the present giving was always on Christmas Eve, and then the sort of religious and the celebrating was on Christmas Day. So um, that's how royal Christmases have, have always been. Round about Christmas time, Diana took the boys to her father and her stepmother, Rain Spencer, and her father, Earl Spencer. And they went there for a few days, and the boys just went crazy, going down the stairs on a, on a sort of, you know, a tray. William, I mean, they were very, very naughty. Queen couldn't deal with it at all, but Spencer, you know, just, oh, that's boys. On Christmas Eve, each family member has their allotted time to arrive. Junior members of the family arrived first, and senior members later. And then they made the big trip to Sandringham. 
and arriving in three cars, I think. So there'd be Charles and Diana and the boys in one, and then there'd be uh, a follow-up car behind, and then there'd be the Range Rover with all the presents. Because, you know, you, they might be very small, the presents, but there were a lot of them. And then they would, everything, you know, they walked out and the Queen would be at the door to greet them, and then everything would be unpacked by staff and all the presents would be put in the right place. And then they would go into tea. And, uh, you know, they'd have a big tea and then the present opening ceremony would begin. So there wasn't, the fact that Charles and Anna weren't really speaking didn't really matter because so much else was going on. So everybody would arrive at whatever destination. Now, Royal Christmases started at Windsor. And then, of course, the, the Christmases moved back to Sandringham. And it was much, much smaller. Um, but Diana's first Christmas at Windsor, uh, she, she hated it. In the afternoon of Christmas Eve, Charles and Diana arrived together at Sandringham in their own chauffeur-driven car, followed as usual by Royal Protection Officers but this time with a Land Rover full of Christmas presents for the entire family. William and Harry had spent the week before Christmas with their grandfather, Earl Spencer, in Althorpe. He wasn't a well man at this time. He'd suffered a stroke and, and of course, was now married to Rain Spencer, you know, often referred to by Diana as Acid Rain. Um, I don't think they had a particularly good relationship at that time, although I, I understand towards the end of Dinah's life, she did. Following tradition, afternoon tea would be served at 5 p.m. in the drawing room, after which the Windsors honor their German heritage by opening presents on Christmas Eve. The present giving is on Christmas Eve, and all the presents are put on trestle tables and with a huge Christmas tree and the little kids' presents are under the tree and the grown-ups' presents are on trestle tables covered in linen cloths and they're done in order of precedence. So if you start off with the Queen and then you go right and then you Prince Charles and you go down and it's, it's got sort of labels and then everybody leaves their presents out so people can look at them. I mean, it's quite bizarre for, for, for us, really. She hated it. She, uh, a, she bought really lovely presents. She bought people cashmere sweaters and beautiful uh, fragrances. And sort of, you know, she was trying really hard and they sort of looked at her and thought, what a waste of money. And they literally give things like, I just it always sticks in my mind that Princess Anne once gave Prince Charles a doormat because that's what she wanted. So their presents were very, very small and very practical. And Diane had got all these very extravagant uh, sort of, as I said, cashmere wraps, cash, cashmere cardigans, cashmere sweaters, and they sort of weren't very grateful. And they have a lot of in-jokes, and, and a lot of the jokes are quite sort of childlike, and Diana couldn't get her head around that. During the day, royals sneak in and lay out their presents, and at 6 p.m. they all gather to open them. They generally buy each other inexpensive and amusing gifts often creating hilarity and laughter on what may otherwise be quite a stuffy occasion. Then they, they would go upstairs and, and change for, for supper and have a beautiful uh, Christmas Eve supper. In the ballroom, trestle tables are laid, covered in linen tablecloths and placed in order of precedence. The Queen's gifts first, then Charles, William and Harry. The most of theirs are under the Christmas tree with the rest of the children's. Every year, they all attend a black tie dinner on Christmas Eve. And after the inevitable drinks, they settle down for a hearty seasonal meal. That Christmas Eve of 1991 was not a harmonious and laughter-filled occasion, as the atmosphere between Diana and Charles could not have been more frosty. Oh, the atmosphere, well, apparently you could have cut it with a knife, you know, that old cliche. It was really bad and everyone was trying to sort of make sure that Charles and Diana weren't left alone together because they, they could, you know, when, when a couple is not speaking, you know, it, it pervades the atmosphere for everybody else. They barely spoke unless they really had to and humor was not in abundance, except when Diana focused her attention on her beloved sons, William and Harry. I really don't think the boys picked up on it because they were so excited, so excitable. They both had new bikes for Christmas 
and they spent a lot of time just zooming around the Sandringham estate on their bicycles. And they had, you know, they had uh, a nanny there. Uh, they would have had their protection officers there. So there was really no reason, and I, I sincerely don't believe they did pick up on it. Um, a lot of people think that they, they were subjected to a lot of the marital rows between their parents, but when you're quite young, um, it's not nearly so noticeable. I mean, William did notice it later, but that particular Christmas, no, they didn't notice it. As far as, as my research has taken me, they, they were really happy and having a good time. As is usual on these formal occasions, once the meal is complete, the men are offered liqueurs, and the women retire to another room for their own discourse, which must have been a relief for Diana. It is said that nobody goes to bed until the queen is retired for the evening, and she often stays up until after midnight at Christmas. Diana felt isolated in all their traditions and rituals, even after years of learning what the family does. She felt claustrophobic and trapped in their royal routine. Every year on Christmas Day, the Queen and all her family gather for a church service at St. Mary Magdalene on the Sandringham Estate. Well-wishers come and watch as the royal family enter the church. After the service, the royals stop and talk to the waiting crowds and wish them a Merry Christmas. The sheer abundance of food and drink for their family Christmas requires a large team to prepare and organize. It is truly an amazing sight to behold, a real royal feast. Lunch is a traditional Christmas lunch, complete with Norfolk turkey and all the trimmings. The queen follows the tradition from her father, King George VI, and grandfather, George V, giving a Christmas pudding to each of her staff. The family is fond of a Christmas cracker, and even the queen wears her paper crown and they take turns reading the silly jokes. Like most fortunate families, the royals tuck in to their Christmas meal, having worked up quite an appetite. Although it is said this was a most difficult time for the young Princess Diana, having had her battles with eating disorders later made very public by the media. Eating disorders, whether it be anorexia or bulimia, show how an individual can turn the nourishment of the body into a painful attack on themselves. At 3 p.m., everyone in the family dutifully sits down to watch the Queen's Christmas broadcast to the nation and the Commonwealth, which is always pre-recorded. In 1952, when I first broadcast to you at Christmas, the world was a very different place to the one we live in today. 25 years ago, my grandfather broadcast the first of these Christmas messages. Today is another landmark, because television has made it possible for many of you to see me in your homes on Christmas Day. This December, we are looking back not just one year, but on a hundred years and a thousand years. Christmas is for most of us a time for a break from work, for family and friends, for presents, turkey and crackers. Each year that passes seems to have its own character. Some leave us with a feeling of satisfaction, others are best forgotten. At Christmas, I'm always struck by how the spirit of togetherness lies also at the heart of the Christmas story. I wish you all a very happy Christmas. Diana found her only confident to be Sarah Ferguson, known as Fergie. The two girls had known each other for a long time. In fact, they became friends as teenagers before they married their respective partners and became sisters-in-law. Diana paved the path for Sarah to meet Andrew. They became close, often seen to be laughing and joking with each other. Fergie was known to bring out Diana's cheeky side. Fergie and Andrew were there, which was great for Diana, because at the time, she and Fergie had hatched this plot to leave the royal family at the same time. 
which was you know a crazy idea but it gave them you know something to sort of focus on because they were both very very unhappy and they took the, their children so Beatrice uh, and Harry and William they used to take them out to a nearby hotel they could go swimming they could get out of the house because I think Sandringham isn't uh, isn't nearly as big as it looks so it's all quite cramped and you're slightly on top of each other so they were desperate to get out and the only other alternative was to sort of sit in your room and pretend to read or something which is as Diana did a lot of that that Christmas. On this particular Christmas, Diana found Fergie in the same position as herself. They were both very unhappy in their marriages and spent much of their time in their rooms together, talking about how they might find a way out of the royal family. All she was ever looking for was to be loved. She used to say to me, all I ever want, Paul, is to someone, a man to put their arms around me and say, I love you. That's not too much to ask, is it? And that's what she was searching for. Well, Diana Spencer, as she was, is probably one of the most insecure people I'd ever met. She was also a real mixture of being completely naive and yet worldly wise. So she was a, a barrel load of contradictions. I mean, Diana could be several people in one day. And I think one of the reasons that people are so fascinated with her still is that she was a different person with different people. So I, so, and I, I take that to be part of her insecurity because she wanted to please the person she was talking to. She wanted to tell them what they wanted to hear. And so um, she was always different, so she was always fascinating. Well, Charles is like um, a very old-fashioned, uh, very respectful, charming man. He likes women. He is definitely not a woman hater. Um, and he is also a people pleaser. But he has got a very short temper. And he's after, if, you know, if he loses his temper, he's then incredibly sorry and full of apologies. So he's, he's basically a very kind and thoughtful and very sensitive person, but because of who he is and the life that he's led, he is used to getting his own way and he's used to getting his own way quickly. I remember very well Prince William being born because on that particular day, the Queen rang her bell and said, send for a bottle of champagne, my favorite, Krug. We'll all have a glass of champagne to toast the birth of my grandson, William. So I stood in the Queen's sitting room at Buckingham Palace with a glass of champagne, toasting William's health. She had this vision of uh, being like a fairy princess and being carried away into the sunset. But the minute she was married, her husband was off working. I mean, it was, you know, he, he's always been a very hard worker and he was devoted to his duty. And on, on the honeymoon, um, she was so in love. And, but he spent a lot of time reading books, which she didn't really quite understand. And, um, I think on, on the honeymoon, it was when her bul bulimia, which she was already having a problem with, uh, really took hold. And she just, you know, she was on this e enormous yacht, Britannia, surrounded by like 200 crew, and yet she was on her own and she didn't know how to deal with it. She was too young and too naive. And, and Charles was on the upper deck reading and sunbathing and she was lonely. During this time, of course, Diana was visiting Balmoral and Sandringham and all the rural residences and actually got to know me very well. I remember her showing me the honeymoon pictures. I remember her telling me that she was carrying another baby. 
which was Harry. She was at Balmoral wearing a very beautiful tartan evening dress for the Gillies Ball, and she pushed me into the dining room. Put your hand on my tummy, she said. I said, no, I can't do that. You're a royal princess. She took my hand and placed it on her tummy. Can you feel that, she said, and a little kick. She says, it's a boy. Ah, <gasps> you shouldn't have told me that. That is a state secret. Now, if it gets out, you'll blame me. She says, but I'm trusting you with that secret. It was the first time she'd actually trusted me. Before the service, the immediate family were alone in the castle with just time enough for the Prince of Wales to explain the history of those celebrated robes. Do you know how old this is? Granny was christened in this. Great granny. Great granny. And I was. Look, I was christened in this. Mm. Looks remarkably well, despite it. Yeah. I think after Harry was born, the relationship seriously broke down. It just hadn't worked out like both of, both of them expected. And, and even before the wedding, Diana had serious doubts, and so did Charles. But it was too late, and her sisters famously said, but Dutch, which was her nickname, your face is on the tea towels. And it's a great line. I know it's been used a lot, but it does sum it all up. It's too late. And Charles's friends, his close, close friends, warned him, this is not going to work, Charles. This is, she's too young, she's too naive, and, you know, you're an imaginary prince. She doesn't know you at all. So it had very little chance. And then if you add that mix to the huge and unprecedented interest in the couple, well, in, especially in Diana, you know, you, you can see it reach boiling point. Now, the royal marriage was falling apart and I was Diana's man, placed strategically at Highgrove, placed there to keep the house in order, but also to be there for Diana, to be there as a rock, she later called me. I've come to the conclusion that really it would have been far easier to have had two wives. <laughs> to have covered both sides of the street. <laughs> and I could have walked down the middle directing the operation. I haven't yet worked out a method of splitting my wife in half. She can do both sides. In the early days, Diana's light was small, but it began to shine brighter and brighter and brighter. And it was a sort of a star is born situation. Prince Charles would say to her, while I married you, I made you a princess. You weren't born royal. I'm the royal. So it would peeve him when on royal visits, people would be shouting on one side of the street, we want Diana, we want Diana. And I think in some interviews, he actually did say, I wish I could split my wife in half to do both sides of the street because they don't actually want me. This is a man who has been born to be king. This is a man who has been treated from the very beginning as a god, suddenly being eclipsed by this woman who wasn't very happy. Well, Charles was so used to having all the attention on him, which it had been since he was born, um, he, he didn't like the idea that they walked down a street, say, when they were doing a, a, a royal engagement, and the crowd were calling, Diana, Diana. So he felt surplus and didn't really know what to do with himself and made lots of sort of rather pathetic remarks, like, there should be two of me, and if I cut myself in half. I mean, he didn't know what to do or say. And, and yes, he, 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 it was a form of, of, of jealousy, yes, it was. The Princess of Wales was a new kind of royal. She carried out her duties with elegance and style, just like other members of the royal family. But there was a difference. She wasn't stuffy, responding to people naturally, and the people took her to their hearts. The rest of the royal family and the royal household, they treated Diana as if she was just another girl. In fact, they didn't give her much consideration at all. 
I did notice that one day, going through the drawing room, the old Queen Mother, she passed the magazine table and Diana's face was on the front of Hello Magazine or something. And as she walked past the table, she flipped the magazine over onto its backside and carried on walking. That to me said, she's not really accepted. They don't like it. She's beginning to outshine even the senior members of the royal family. This is a dangerous territory. It appeared that she didn't take long to learn. The endless handshakes during hundreds of walkabouts proved no problem to her. She always looked pleased to meet anyone, and the crowds were delighted to meet her. The princess was eager to move to the dance floor to the applause of the 700 guests. To the strains of Isn't She Lovely, the pair went into a royal shuffle. They soon loosened up to a kind of rock and roll, which proved to be an enormous crowd pleaser. Before the eyes of the world, it seemed that the romantic schoolgirl had flowered into a serene, self-confident princess. But it was a veneer. In private, the princess was not living the fairy tale. It was impossible to do this balancing act between the prince and the princess, the prince during the week and the princess at the weekend, and then have someone else pop in to this menage a trois. It was incredibly difficult because the princess would ring me up from London and say, where's Prince Charles tonight, Paul? Where's the Prince of Wales? He's out for dinner, Your Royal Highness. Where is he? I've no idea. Of course you know where he is. You always know where he is. Who's he got for dinner tomorrow night? I hear he's got a dinner party. Who's coming? Don't ask me. Please ask him. Don't put me in the middle. I suddenly found myself as Piggy in the middle, trying to please both. It couldn't work. One day I told the princess that the prince was out. The prince found out. I'd been talking to the princess, thinking I'd been gossiping to her. He called me into his library. He rang his bell. I went into the library, stood there. Your Royal Highness, I, I hear you've had a conversation with my wife. Well, why are you talking about me being out last night? I'm sorry, Your Highness, but you were. Well, can't you lie? You're asking me to lie about you not being in residence. Yes, why, why did you do what you bloody told? And he picked up a book and started to stamp on the spot like a petulant child. And he hurled this book at me across the room. I dodged and missed it. And I thought, you know, I think my time's up. I think it's time I got out. Her larking with the Duchess of York on the ski slopes at Closters also caused much consternation. The Prince of Wales had been educated in maintaining the mystique of monarchy, and such high-spiritedness was anathema to this. It wasn't long after that speculation about the state of the marriage became a popular sport. At that time, everybody was saying, good luck, and I hope everything goes well, and how lucky you are to be engaged to such a lovely lady. And my goodness, I was lucky enough to marry her. And uh, we had many, many messages. <laughs> Amazing what ladies do when your back's turned. <laughs> It's not just the, you know, the Christmas and, and Christmas Day. It was, it was a good stretch of five or six or seven days. I think it might have even been 10 days. So it would go from Christmas and all the shooting, because Sandringham is a shooting estate. So uh, as soon as Boxing Day came, there'd be a huge shoot, and then there'd be another shoot a few days later. It gave the Queen and Prince Philip and uh, Charles and Andrew and Edward a chance to uh, invite a few friends and go shooting. So it was all, it revolved around the sport. Um, so for the women in the party, unless they went out shooting too, it was, it was pretty tedious. Dinah and Fergie were very close. There was a little bit of jealousy. 
on Diana's part, because she felt that Fergie breezed into the royal family and everyone loved her and they looked at her, Di her Diana and thought she was dull, and that Fergie was this load of fun and noisy and lovable and, well, she, which she was. Um, but Fergie was very unhappy too. Diana and Fergie had this great relationship and they used to do crazy things together. They got out the Queen Mother's Bentley from the garage, put on a chauffeur's hat and sort of did wheelies all round the drive with the car. No one found out. So they used to do these crazy things and, and I think it just lightened the atmosphere for them. Her family weren't there for her to support her. There are no support mechanism for Diana through her bulimia, through the mental torture. I wasn't trained as a psychiatrist. I was only trained to be a friend. I was only there to be a shoulder to lean on, a shoulder to cry on, to pass, pass the tissue box. I was just there. She was never alone because I was there. She was lonely, but never alone. It was difficult for me to tread the path between Prince Charles and Princess Diana. Now Diana arrived every weekend with the boys on Friday afternoon and left every Sunday. But someone else occupied that space in between. And I learned to serve two royal mistresses. One, Princess of Wales, and the other, Mrs. Parker Bowles. This was still a secret. I was keeping this secret from both the prince and the princess. Until, of course, it became intolerable. Well, I think what happened with the Queen was that she sat on the fence, hoping it was all going to get better, which I think is probably what you would do. That's the normal reaction of a mother. You don't want to interfere. But of course, and then Prince Philip was, was saying, little bit, little bit, you've got to do something. And so he was egging her on and she was pulling back because you don't want to interfere in, in other people's lives. But eventually, Diana used to come to the Queen to, uh, and the Queen's page of the presence and say, I've got to see Her Majesty. And, and the page would say, well, I'm, I'm really sorry, um, Your Royal Highness, but she's busy. She's with the Prime Minister or she's with whoever she was with. And Diana would wait until whoever it was left, and then she'd run in, <laughs> which was absolutely unprecedented. And there was the Queen. She'd just been having a meeting with some government minister or some, someone really senior in, a, in another world, not in the royal world. And she was probably thinking about it. And then Diana pops through the door crying and saying, Mum, Mum, everybody hates me, you've got to help me, I, you know, I, you know, hysterical. And nothing in the Queen's life had ever prepared her for, for that, that kind of confrontation. Imagine if you were brought up in this very, very strict world when everybody is also very respectful and there's very little emotion going on. And so the Queen had never, ever had to deal with this. And the royal family really don't have to deal with anything they don't want to deal with emotionally because they've got people around them to say, sorry, can't put you through. Sorry, they're busy. You know, you're protected. Um, so the queen used to find this really difficult. And then I think then Prince Philip obviously said to her, look, a little bit, I'll see what I can do. So he started to write letters to Diana because at least he knew she'd listen and she'd read them. And they were very, very nice letters. Um, and she used to show them to her girlfriends, uh, or sometimes to Paul Burrell, her, her butler. And she is looking at these letters. And, and Prince Philip starts off very, very gently. Then he sort of starts put, making a few pointers to her. Now, being in the royal family is not about you, Diana. It's about all of us together. It's not a popularity contest. Um, so he got a little bit stricter. And then Diana just got fed up with it. He really, really tried very, very hard. And she was grateful to him. And, and she, she, she was very grateful and she said, thank you for trying. And then he would say, well, I'm not a marriage counselor, but I'm trying to help you. I was a stranger in this family too, it's not easy. So it was very good for a bit. It's remarkable what a good night's sleep can do, though the princess still looked very pale. 
However she felt, she had to work hard again, hedged about by crowds, arms reaching out, demanding and expecting a handshake. She visited a children's hospital, then faced touring three more pavilions of Expo before the long flight to Japan and another tour. Yesterday, when she reached the California Pavilion of Expo, the princess had already trudged through four other pavilions. It was hot, tiring work, and the crowds were forever pressing in, trying for a closer view. Lost for the moment in these crowds in the stuffy pavilion, she stumbled and briefly fainted. Her doctor, Surgeon Commander Ian Jenkins, with the beard, helped her away. In slow motion, you can see she was in some distress. The prince, attempting to look unconcerned, followed behind. She was taken to a washroom where she recovered. The couple had spent a month apart when they reunited to visit Welsh flood victims. But after a few hours together, Prince Charles went straight back to Scotland. The rumours about their marriage were now presented as fact. The prince was also absent during the princess's 30th birthday celebrations. The press were now calling the marriage a cause for concern. 1991 was the last Christmas Charles and Diana were together in the eyes of the public though she would still return to Sandringham to spend time with her boys in the following years. As they welcomed in the new year, 1992, the family was hopeful for a more pleasant year. But as it turned out, it would be the Queen's Annus Horribilis. After all the festivities were over, Charles and Diana went on their tour to India. In Jaipur, Diana and Charles didn't want to kiss each other. She was presenting him with a prize, and he, he leant forward to kiss her, and she moved her head away, which was the classic picture, because this is a woman who is just longing to humiliate her husband, and she humiliated him in front of the world because the picture went all over the world. Diana took advantage of the press and posed in photos that would reveal the state of their marriage. By this time, she was an absolute wizard at the photo opportunity and making herself either, you know, she could, she could look anything. And she, the photographers wanted her to sit in front of the Taj Mahal. And she realized that this, was a, this Taj Mahal was built as a symbol of love. And there she was, all on her own. And, and she posed beautifully with her legs folded and she looked very wistful and she'd never looked more lonely. The fact that Charles was doing another engagement in, a, in, a, in, another, in another area was irrelevant. It looked like she was there in front of the symbol of love all on her own. So it sent out a message to the world, I am all on my own. When asked about the experience, Diana said it had been very healing. When asked why, she said, work it out for yourself. In March 1992, Diana's father died, an event that would drive a wedge between the couple as she lost one of the few people in her life she could trust and confide in. So Charles and Diana got together just long enough to organize a holiday, and they took the boys to Lek skiing with a load of friends to have this really nice holiday and very, Shortly after they arrived, Diana's sister, who wasn't on, it, on the holiday, phoned through and said that, that Lord Spencer had died. He, he'd been ill for some time. And she burst into tears and said, I've got, I'm gonna go, I've got to go home immediately. And, and she said, I'm not going with Charles. It, it, I don't want him near me. I, don't, I just don't want him around. And Charles said, but, but Diana, we, we have to go together. So they had big row about that and eventually she agreed that for the sake of protocol that they would draw they would go back together an airplane of the Queen's flight has been fueled up at Zurich Airport since early this morning waiting to take the royal couple back to London the two princes have been left behind to continue with their skiing tuition Earl Spencer had asked to be laid to rest inside the 13th century St Mary's Church which stands alongside the Althorpe estate his coffin was carried in with little ceremony. The Earl had left instructions that his funeral should not be unduly mournful. Indeed, he often talked and joked about joining his ancestors inside the Spencer Chapel. The royal mourners, who'd cut short a skiing holiday, arrived at midday, emerging from the third car back. The distraught princess kept her head bowed throughout. 
Amid reports of Spencer family rifts, this service was seen as one of unity. It was wonderful to see the whole family united yes. there, well, expressing their love and their respect and their affection for him. At the Earl's request, the rousing service included a trumpet fanfare, but no amount of fatherly wishes could prevent the princess from holding back her grief today. Earl Spencer had said he wanted no flowers, instead donations to the National Association of Boys Clubs, of which he was chairman. Yet still they came with very special tributes, none more so than the bouquet from a very loving and heartbroken daughter. Well, I think the death of her father was very, very sad for her because she felt he was the only person that really understood her situation outside of the her immediate friends and he'd always been there for her. he was so wise She'd say oh daddy was so wise and she could although he wasn't a well man she could talk to him and she i think it was just the, the shock of him not being there anymore but it did bring her closer to her stepmother rain but she was very very sad about it uh, and quite understandably so and in a way i think it pushed her even further from charles because she felt he didn't understand. Andrew Morton's book, which featured considerable contributions from the Princess of Wales, was released, and much of the detail of what went wrong in their marriage would be revealed for all to see. Publication of Andrew Morton's book caused newspaper headlines throughout the world. He not only asserted that the princess was unhappily married, but claimed that she tried to commit suicide, he called them cries for help, the book was based on evidence supplied by some of the princess's closest friends, and the suspicion lingered that her friends would never talk without her permission. That the princess couldn't hold back the tears after an affectionate display of loyalty on her first public appearance after the book's publication. Well, the Andrew Morton book was a sensation. No one had any idea that Diana was involved with the book at all. And in fact, she even denied that she was at the beginning. But what happened? was she decided, she made a decision that she wanted the world, if you like, to know the truth of her marriage. She was just, felt it was going to be really cathartic. I, I don't know if she ever regretted it. I think she probably did because it caused so much trouble. But I know that Prince Charles had the uh, newspaper faxed to him. I mean, it was so explosive. And they had some guests staying and I think Prince Charles he didn't know what to do, so he just went out for a walk to gather his thoughts. And then he went upstairs and he confronted Diana, which must have been pretty horrific. She ran down the stairs in tears, out of the house, into the car, and drove back to London. She denied contributing for a long time and had to keep up the pretense of all being well in the royal household. She continued to attend events with the family, even though tensions were very high. The tapes of Diana and James Gilby were released, revealing Diana's intimate relationship with another man. The state of their marriage by this point was obvious to the press and public. Trooping the color on the Saturday, and she appeared standing with all the royal family as if nothing had happened. So she was absolutely having kittens. The next serialization was about to come out the next day. And, um, and then it was the week, the week of Royal Ascot and she had to be around the royal family. And um, so Prince Philip cut her completely dead. Obviously the queen still spoke to her, but it was very, very awkward. But the press continued to pry into her private life to an alarming degree. There were so-called secretly recorded tapes everywhere. First, Diana Gate, allegedly a conversation between the princess and a male companion she called Squidgy. A recording of Diana speaking to one of her friends, who actually was her lover, James Gilby, appeared in one of the newspapers. The transcript of this recording was unbelievable. It was, and he called her Squidgy, and she, she 
told him all her woes about and what she thought about members of the royal family and you know how the queen mother how the cold the queen mother was and um, it, it was an extraordinary extraordinary explosive moment and really there was very little that the queen could do after that had been out in the public domain the queen insisted they still attend the tour in south korea together and try to keep up some semblance of stability in their marriage but it failed the prince and princess looked so uncomfortable neither of them wanted to be around each other and the media picked up on it very quickly by this time, she couldn't even stand to have Charles near her and vice versa. Um, but anyhow, the, Charles knew they had to go, the Queen knew they had to go, and Diana knew that she had to go, but it was a disaster. They were called, I think they nicknamed them the Glums. And I mean, they just were stony-faced the entire time. So it actually was a PR disaster. You've never seen a couple look more distant. By the end of 1992, Charles and Diana's separation was announced. She would have more freedom for her humanitarian work and dedicating herself to helping others. She would find her feet, overcome some of her health issues, and grow into her own style. But part of her still wanted to repair the marriage to the prince with whom she had once fallen in love and keep the family together. However, in the years to come, that would prove impossible, as the secrets of their marriage would be revealed one by one. In 1986, in a letter to an unidentified correspondent, Charles wrote, how awful incompatibility is, and how dreadfully destructive it can be for the players in this extraordinary drama. It has all the ingredients of a Greek tragedy. I never thought it would end up like this. The magical royal marriage was falling apart. Charles would later admit in an interview that he had started his affair with Camilla about this time. And Diana would also start an affair with Major James Hewitt. It was, according to Charles, irretrievably broken down by this time. Well, Charles was in love with Camilla from a very early age, you know, when he was still in the Navy, he fell in love with Camilla. She was funny. She was a great rider, and she made him laugh. And I think that Camilla has this, she, she's very, very attractive to both men and women because of her personality. She's got a wonderful personality. And, you know, when Charles first met her, I mean, she didn't care what she looked like, but, you know, she was a great horsewoman. She was really sporty. And I suppose she was a challenge, too, because, you know, she was basically in love with Andrew Parker Bowles. So I think she had a lot of ingredients that Charles really, really fell in love with, and um, he never really fell out of love with her. So it is, it is a very romantic story. The royal couple both dutifully went on tour to Canada in 1986. And although all appeared to be running smoothly on the launch of the new Skytrain, Diana was on her last legs. Behind closed doors, it was over. They reached their breaking point and neither could see a way to fix their marriage. Diana was stuck, playing pretend to the press and keeping up appearances, trapped in a life she thought she could never escape. But slowly the press began to notice, spotting their tendency to carry out separate engagements and the physical distance between the prince and princess. In 1989, Diana and Charles were both invited to the birthday party of Camilla's sister, Annabelle. Diana arrived separately, and feeling hopeless and humiliated by Charles, she decided to confront Camilla. I think Diana was terrified. She says she was, and she looked for Charles. She was looking, they went to uh, uh, Annabelle Goldsmith's house, um, beautiful house in Richmond and there was a, it was a big party on, on probably on three or four floors and she looked around where's Charles where's Charles and then she uh, realized that he must be downstairs on the on the lower level in the sort of basement area 
not a basement like we know, but a very glamorous downstairs rooms. I heard my name being called, and it was her. And um, she said, I can't find my husband or Camilla can. So I said, ah, what do, what, what, do you, what do you want to do? And she said, well, I'm going to go and find them. I said, well, do you want me to come? Yes. I thought, ah, oh, I wish I'd never said that, but um, I did. She went down there, and there they were. I didn't know what Diana was going to say next, but um, she literally went up to Camilla and, and said, stop treating me like an idiot. I know exactly um, what's going on. And then, you know, she, she obviously got this real anger, because you'd have to be very angry to do that, and brave, and she just confronted Camilla and said, you know, don't, I'm not stupid, I know what's going on. So Camilla must have been completely taken aback. And then Camilla said this, this phrase, which I, well, I'll never forget. She said, well, it's OK for you. You know, you've got two wonderful boys. And I could see the prince would be very uncomfortable in this situation, as indeed I was. And um, I started to move away. And I said, no, stay, stay there, stay there. I mean, you don't expect that to happen. And uh, Diana was shaking with fear and rage. And um, on the way back in the car, she was just in hysterical tears. And her, her protection officer, Ken Wharf, was with her. And, and so and he, he confirms all this, that she just sobbed all the way home. And I don't think Charles said a word. But I think that was the turning point, really, of the relationship, because you know, soon thereafter, I think Diana had then given up any hope of a reconciliation. Because I think, to be honest, I think she firmly believed that something, you know, like a return to normality within her marriage could happen. I, I think she really held out hope that that might happen. But I think this, this meeting, I think, probably scotched it. I think she realized then that there's little or no chance of us returning to a, a normal married life. Despite a few troubled years, the traditions of the royal family endure. Christmas is a time of coming together, of love, celebration, and forgiveness. Even in recent years, the House of Windsor has faced controversy and turbulence. But when the Christmas decorations go up, there's always a joy and a hope that next year, things will be better.